And Jane looks out at her creation, at the creation, and she sees that, that it is extraordinary. And she wonders, where does it come from? What is it that creates all of this? What was before all of this? And thinking in this way, and she obviously thinks that she is just a, a tiny, incidental, insignificant little body that is going to last in the scheme of things, just, just a moment. So she has a sense of this vast and extraordinary universe that somehow created everything that she sees, including herself. So she wonders, what is it that created this? Where does this come from? And asking this question, her mind goes, it travels as it were through the creation that she sees to something beyond and she conceives of something at an infinite distance from herself that is somehow outside the universe that she perceives that must have created this universe. So Jane conceives th 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 this creator, Jane conceives this creator, God, as something at an infinite distance from herself, outside of herself, that created her world. And so she then, she then wonders, how, how could I ever have a relationship with this God at an infinite distance from myself? What, what would I have to do? What, what, and because this God is at an infinite distance from herself and essentially unknowable, the, the best she can do is believe in it. Pray to it, believe it. Have a, she has a feeling for it, her, her, and her feeling for God is, is very true. It comes from her intuition that there is something much bigger than her own finite self that gives rise to all of this, but she conceives of that something in a way that is consistent with her belief in being a separate self. So although her intuition about God or the ultimate reality is true, the way she thinks of it is simply a reflection of her belief in her sense of herself as, as a separate self. So she conceives as, of God as the separate other at, at an infinite distance from herself. And this is the conventional religious model. What she doesn't know, although she intuits it, but what she doesn't know is that the ultimate reality the ultimate creator of this extraordinary and vast universe that she perceives is identical to her very own self. Although she has this intuition, she doesn't yet know that what the world is out there is identical to what she is in here. And so she, she spends much of her life following exoteric religion, praying to a God at an infinite distance from herself. Anyway, because of this intuition that she has, she is led by a series of apparently chance events to a retreat at Garrison. And she, she's given a, a, a new model of this, of this so-called creator God. She, she is, um, she begins to, to, to realize that what she is in the depths of herself is the same as what the universe is. That the, 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 the apparent distinction between herself and all objects and others is only an appearance. That underlying this appearance there is a, a fundamental unity of being. And that that unity of being is accessible to her through the knowledge I am because the knowledge I am is the knowledge of being all that is required is to remove the limitations that we have placed on that being and then she begins to think about the 
the uh, sayings in the Bible that she was brought up with when, when Jesus said, I and my Father are one. What I essentially am and what the universe essentially is are, are the same being refracted into a multiplicity and diversity of objects and others only through the limitations of each of our minds. But behind those limitations there is this fundamental unity of being. The being in each of us borrows its apparently individual existence from that shared being. And that shared being is what is traditionally called God. And that is why that the, the highest prayer is is silent because the, uh, silence is the highest prayer because we we cannot go from ourselves to God we cannot make any movement from ourselves to God because any movement from ourself or away from ourself would be a movement away from God there is no pathway from ourself to God God is not at an infinite distance from ourself. God is utterly intimate with. God is the very self of each of us. And because we are already that self, we cannot approach God. We cannot take a step towards God. Any step we take would be an apparent step away. In fact, we cannot even step away from God because we take ourselves with us wherever we go. So when we realize this, we realize that praying to God is, is simplistic. I don't mean to criticize it because before Jane knows any better it's all she can do because Jane has this intuition. The, rea the ultimate reality is much bigger than myself so she has this intuition and because of her conditioning she conceives God at an infinite distance from herself and supplicates. She prays to that God but in time her understanding is refined and refined and refined and refined until she realizes that the, the God that she has been praying to is the very self of herself. And there is a beautiful um, line that um, I, I heard once from an Italian monk who said, Lord, thou art the love with which I love thee. I thought that, that the Lord was an infinite distance from myself and that I was loving that God. So my love started in my heart, f went for, for an infinite distance to my God. And then I realized th thou art the very love in my heart with which I was loving me. Th you are closer to me than myself. You are my very self. I cannot love thee because you are that love. You are at the origin of myself. Never at, you are never the destiny. You can never be a destiny. You can never be something I travel to. You are always where I travel from. The complete surrender of everything that seems to limit you, the complete letting go, surrender is it's another name for self-inquiry. It's another name for this. It's the letting go of everything that seems to limit you. The letting go of everything that is superfluous to you. And letting go, letting go, letting go until you arrive at that element of yourself that you cannot let go of. Your, your, your naked, self-aware being. Yes, so if you, you have this this feeling for God. So in your case, think of it more as surrender in rather than self-inquiry. It's the same thing. It's exactly the same thing. Understanding is always timeless. Have you noticed that? It never takes time to understand anything. It takes time to think about things, but the moment of understanding is always like that. In fact, 
understanding doesn't take place in a moment. It, it's, it's literally timeless because there is no mind there. Understanding takes place when mind comes to an end. In other words, understanding is the revelation of the background of consciousness. That's what understanding is. That, that's the same experience as truth. Uh, understanding or truth. It's the same experience of, as love or beauty. They are not experiences of the mind. Although they have a, a mind that has plunged into its source, comes out of that experience refreshed with new knowledge. Such a mind has been transformed by this, by its plunge, its momentary plunge into its essence. But the actual experience of understanding itself is, is not in the mind. Understanding never takes place in the mind. Thought takes place in the mind, but understanding takes place when thought comes to an end. So, what we are doing here with thinking is not going towards understanding, as if understanding will finally happen. What we are doing with, with these, um, this analysis of, of our experience is to try to undermine, try to undermine all the beliefs that we have superimposed onto our experience. So these th we're just clearing away, clearing away, clearing away. Clear we're not actually creating understanding. The understanding itself never happens in the mind. The clearing away can happen as a result of these conversations. But the actual revelation itself is never something that takes place in the mind. It is prior to mind. That, that, that's what's so beautiful about this word revelation from revelare to, to lay bare. The, it's always a, a, a laying bare, a revealing of reality, never a creating of reality. A revealing of what is always there prior to experience, not as a result of experience, but which for most of us is obscured by experience. Let's start with the first question about what do I mean by being aware of being aware? So if I were to ask you the question, are you aware of your thoughts right now? What would you say? Right now I'm not having any thought. I'm okay. just listening to you. Fair, but fair yes, enough. but normally, that, yes. Okay, so let me ask you another question. Are you aware of the sound of my voice. Of course, I have to keep talking for you to be aware yes. of the sound. You're okay. Perfect. Are you aware of 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 these flowers? Yes, I can see them. Yeah. Are you aware of uh, the sensation at the soles of your feet? Yes. Okay. Are you aware of the trees behind you? No. Turn I around. would have to turn around and. S and are you aware of them when you turn around? Yes. Okay. So. Each time I ask you this question, first, are you aware of my voice? You direct your attention to my voice. And as a result of being aware of my voice, you say yes. Then I ask you about your, the flowers. You move your attention from my voice to the flowers. I then ask you, are you aware of the sensation at the soles of your feet? You take your direction, your attention off the flowers and you, as it were, shine your attention on the tingling at the soles of your feet. And then when I ask you, are you aware of the trees behind you? You have to turn around and you shine your attention in that direction. Yes? Mm -hmm. Am I speaking yes. your experience? Okay. So now, if I were to ask you the question, not are you aware of a, B, or C, but simply, are you aware? What would you say? Yeah, I'm here. No, not are you here, are you aware? Yes, I'm aware. Okay. Now, what do you do with your attention to come up with that answer? All the previous questions, every time I asked you, are you aware of this object, 
you had to shine your attention on that object. And it was only because you shone your attention on that object that you said yes. When I first asked you if you were aware of the trees, you said no. But then you turned around and you shone your attention on the trees. And as a result of that experience, you said yes. Now, I asked you the question, are you aware? You paused and you said yes. What did you do with your attention in that pause? I went in. Um, Where did you go? Sim something somewhat similar, interesting. Because when you asked me, are you aware of the sensation of your sole of your feet? It was a going in Okay. Sensations. When you say, when I, okay, you, 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 you go, as it were, inside the body. You go to a, an experience that seems to be inside, as opposed to the trees which seem to be outside. Yeah. But when you go inside the body, go now inside the body. Close your eyes and explore with your attention the experience of the inside of the body. All that's there is sensation. Yeah, It's right. just sensation. There's nothing else there apart from sensation. Yes? Right. Now, if you explore your mind, all that you find there are thoughts and images. Yes? Yeah. So, when you, so where do you go to find the experience of being aware? You don't go into the body. You don't go into the mind. You've already agreed all there is to the body is sensation. All there is to the mind is thought and perception. Yet the experience of being aware is an experience. You don't believe now that you are aware. It is your experience. Yes? Now, yes. where do you go to find that experience? What do you do with your attention? Um... Yes, in other words, it's the opposite of a focusing of the attention. It's actually a defocusing of the attention. Mm -hmm. Because the experience of being aware is not an object that you can direct your attention towards. Yes? Right. But nevertheless, so it, it is a, it is a non-objective experience. You cannot deny the experience of being aware. It is an experience, but it has no objective qualities. Yes. Right. Now, if I were to ask you, what is it that experiences being aware? I guess I would have to say itself. That's what I mean by the experience of being aware of being aware. Oh. Exactly right. What else? could experience awareness other than awareness. Because only awareness is aware. The body is not aware. Only awareness is aware. So what is it that could have the experience of being aware or awareness? Only itself. Now, awareness doesn't have to move away from itself in order to know the experience of being aware. It needs to move away from itself to shine on the tree or the flower or the sensation or the thought. It has to rise as attention. Attention means to stretch towards. Attention stretches itself towards the apparent object. But to know itself... It doesn't have to rise. It doesn't have to go anywhere. Attention doesn't need to rise. Attention only needs to rise to know an object. To know itself, awareness need only be itself. So the, the way to know awareness is simply to be knowingly awareness. And the reason, to go on to your second question, the reason that you feel there is a, 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 a wall, a blank wall, that is covering awareness, it, it is because you are trying to direct your attention towards it. The closest you can get, attention can get, 
to attending to awareness is to attend to a blank state. A blank state is an object. So there is a blank state that mi which is a state of the finite mind. And it mimics the true emptiness of awareness. Now we can direct our attention towards a blank state. And this is often misunderstood as meditation. Meditation is not the direction of the attention towards a blank state. It is the sinking of attention into the emptiness of its source. The reason you feel there is this barrier is because you are trying to find awareness with attention. Attention, awareness can never become the object of a, a sorry, awareness can never become the object of attention. It is its subject or its source. So it is a relaxation of the attention, not a directing of the attention. So if we ask, how can I get there? How do I do it? There is no how to. If I were to ask you to stand up, no, I'm not asking you to do this, but if I were to ask you to stand up, to stand up and, and say, how could you take a step towards yourself? Try to take a step towards yourself. How would you do that? How would you take a step towards yourself? If I said, take a step towards these flowers, you would know what to do. You could do that. You could practice that. You could walk. Or if I said, take a step towards the trees, you could practice it. You could turn around and start walking. The only thing you cannot walk towards is yourself. You can only walk towards something that is not yourself. So you, in this metaphor, is awareness. The only thing that awareness can attend to is not itself. And in order to know something that is not itself, it has to rise in the form of attention or mind. Then it directs itself towards the object. But it cannot attend to itself in the same way that you cannot walk towards yourself. Because you are already standing in yourself as yourself. Awareness is already standing in itself as itself. There is no how to because it's already there. There's only a how to go somewhere else. So any practice is a, is a movement away. This is why I call it a non-practice. It is the cessation of the practice of rising as attention and directing awareness towards the object. It, it is a, a non-practice. However, if our attention is so accustomed to directing itself towards objects most of the time, then this directing of the attention will seem to us to be the natural state. So as a compassionate concession to one who is accustomed to attending most of the time to objects, the teaching says, okay, as a practice, direct your attention towards yourself. The teaching knows better. Or the teaching knows that it's, you can't do that. But as a concession to the... It, it's, it's like a horse that is galloping away from its stable. If you want the horse to go back to the stable, you don't just pull on the reins and turn it round. You, you very slowly turn it round. The horse thinks it's always galloping in the same direction. You turn it round without the horse realizing that it's being turned round. It's just, from its point of view, it's just galloping forwards. It doesn't realize after a while that it's galloping home. So it's, it's a little bit the same. The teaching as a concession to the mind that is habituated to focusing on objects. The teaching says, practice self-inquiry. Investigate your true nature. Turn, return your attention to its source. These are skillful means. But actually, when, we, when, when awareness is divested of its limitations, awareness realizes, not only does it r recognize itself, I'm caricaturing awareness now, but it, it says, oh, I've always been myself. I never truly left myself and became a finite mind. 
I was never truly limited. I never really left home. This is why in India they say they, they talk about the illusion of ignorance rather than ignorance. There is no awareness, never, never has to become a separate self in order to know itself. It never, in fact, ceases to be and know itself alone. So the reason I say that is if you feel that you have to practice this relaxation of the attention in its source and and for instance as I said as I said sometimes over the last few days if you have to lovingly remind the attention that what it is looking for is doesn't reside at its destiny it resides at its source these are concessions Compassionate concessions, with their ways of inviting, lovingly inviting the attention back to its source. When it gets back to its source, we realize oh, attention actually never leaves awareness. But until that is clear, it is legitimate to talk about self-inquiry or self-investigation self abidance It seems to be a practice from the point of view of a finite mind. And if it seems to be a practice, then we should practice it, but very lovingly. It, it's not a disciplined practice. It's, it's a loving, think of it more as a, as a loving cooperation. You're working lovingly with your attention inviting it gently to come back to its home in the heart. In a short moment of awareness, there is alertness and clarity. The stream of thoughts flow on by with no need to change them. They fade without a trace in awareness. The clarity of awareness is the source of mental stability and a balanced view. What is awareness? Relax. Stop thinking. Notice the clarity and alertness. This is awareness. It is naturally present, wide open like the sky. When the next thought appears, simply recognize awareness. Restful awareness is required for both thinking and for noticing the absence of thought. Whenever you remember, throughout the day, choose awareness again and again. Let all thoughts flow on by, like the flight path of a bird in the sky. Make the choice of awareness. For short moments, Many times, it will become automatic. It is guaranteed that these short moments of sky-like awareness will transform your life. Try it, just for today, and see for yourself. Short moments of awareness, repeated many times, become automatic.